Welcome to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. There are no traffic jams along the extra mile when you're studying for your bar exam. And now your hosts, Jackson Mummy and Megan Saya from Celebration Bar Review. Hey everybody, welcome. It is Wednesday, June 8th. We are just wrapping up the dreaded seventh week at about 50 days until the exam. Megan, feels a little weird, doesn't it? The seventh week always hits hard and this was no exception. Goodness, I'm happy to be back. I was battling COVID last week and it took me out. This is the first time I had escaped it for two years. The first time I've gotten it and Woo. Yeah, I was right there with everybody. I know we had some students who were dealing with COVID last week. I know we had students dealing with a lot of big, difficult family and life situations. So if that's one of you guys that you're not alone, definitely know that this is always a crazy week in the bar study process. And this year was no different. Yeah, definitely. And what we've known for years is that at about Uh, 42 to 50 days out, it is just a really tough emotional time for people because the the exam seems so close and yet your proficiency isn't ready for the exam yet. And it feels close, but as Megan and June knows, 50 days is a very long time, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But I think there is something psychological about when you hit that June, when that calendar says June, it feels like the exam is next month, which it is but it is at the end of next month, but it really feels functionally it's it could be in, in a couple weeks. Yeah, and it's in a sadistic sort of way. It's interesting to follow on Reddit or Twitter and see all the disasters that, that people impose on themselves. And I hate to see people blowing up, but they're, they're generally just that pressure of the moment. And somebody was talking about one of the websites of a, another bar review, and they said, it's like the ice cream machine at McDonald's. It just never works. <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty good comment. So anyway, hopefully we are all working here, but we are glad that you all are here. And we hope that you are surviving all of the health and craziness and the emotional challenges that come with this. One thing I will say about the, the dreaded seventh week, as I call is that when it is over, people generally feel like, okay, I'm back on equilibrium and now I understand where to go. Is that a true statement? Yeah, yeah. So hopefully that's all of you. If it's not, reach out, let us know how we can help, go to group coaching, things like that. But yes, hopefully people will start to feel like, all right, we're on June 8th and the exam probably doesn't feel much closer today than it did to you on June 1st. So you can start to get your balance a little bit more in your bearings of, all right, we still have a little bit of time. It's not, it's not barreling down the road at me quite yet. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. We are going to barrel down the road today. We're going to take student questions. And then this week we decided a student and a student discovered that one of our lectures was not working properly. I'm not going to go into the technical part of it. It was the only lecture I think that had that particular problem. But as I went and dug in a little bit, it was on MBE tips. And I went back and listened, and it was actually probably a six or seven-year-old lecture that I did. And I thought, yeah, no, I'm not sure I really like that anymore. I think I've got better tips. So today, I think we're going to do five of our 10 tips for the MBE, and next week we'll cover the next five. And this time I get to have Megan help me with the tips. And so stick around for that. I think you're going to find that really interesting. So Megan, I'm going to throw it back to you, and uh, you tell us what, what we're talking about next. All right, great. The big news in the bar exam this week was that the 2021 statistics snapshot came out from the National Conference of Bar Examiners. So these are really interesting numbers because we get a glimpse every year, and it obviously you'll notice it's from 2021, not from 2022 yet. So we get a glimpse as to what happened in the previous year with the bar exam. So who took the bar, how many people, what the makeup of those people is in terms of what kinds of law schools did they go to? Were they from ABA approved law schools or not? Were they foreign trained attorneys? And then what the pass rates are. they do overall and they break it down by the February exam and the July exam. Jackson, any interesting things that you want to discuss with the students here today that you feel might be uh, informative for them? Yeah, you and I can geek out over these numbers a lot, but one of the things to understand is that in 2021, 30% of the bar takers were repeat bar takers. And for the February exam, there was actually a majority of repeat bar takers versus first time takers. That's not a surprise. The number of repeat takers continues to grow year to year. The pass rate for repeat bar takers in 2021 was uh, 28%. And I'm guessing 
and I think you would agree, Megan, when we look at 2022, we'll probably end up seeing a number that's lower than 28%. It's a pretty, it's a pretty stunning number that only 28% of repeat bar takers pass, don't you think? Yeah, so in 2020, 33% of repeaters passed. So certainly uh, downward, we're in a current downward trend, which we don't love to see. <laughs> Yeah, and I think this is this speaks to why the the NCBE is trying to figure out what to do about the bar exam and how to reconfigure it because you just can't have this many people failing the exam over and over again and ask yourself is that really a fair test when they graduated law school or they're uh, competent. The the other interesting thing to me is the percentage of uh, repeat bar takers who pass in July is only 22%. I know that if you're a repeat bar taker, as most of our students uh, who come to us are, and you're looking at that 22% number for the upcoming July exam based on the historical number, I'm going to say what Megan and I in June and others have said all along. You have to bring every tool you can to be successful. If you are trying to do this without enough hours of study, without following the approaches that we're taking, if you're not mind mapping, if you're not using the uh, writing styles that we're giving you, the numbers say you're not going to be successful. And I think it's so critical for people to understand this. Our students do very well. We beat those numbers, I think, even though we're self-reported. I think we're doing better than the, the national rates. But I can tell you that when people don't pass, it's because they're not taking advantage of all the opportunities that we give them in this course. And to me, that's probably one of the, the really uh, striking takeaways from these numbers. Yeah. What about anything you wanted to talk about in the 10-year trend chart? I love that one because that gives us a really big picture. We can have this variation from exam to exam, and certainly 2020 was a really weird year for the bar exam. 2021 was also pretty quirky. So any sort of notes or takeaways from the 10-year look? Yeah. So the NCBE gives us this interesting 10-year look by overall and first time. They don't break out repeaters specifically, but the overall pass rates, if we go back 10 years ago to 2012, in California, the overall pass rate in that bar exam was 51%. So it wasn't great 10 years ago. Now it's 48%. If we go to Florida, the overall pass rate 10 years ago, brace yourself, it goes from 71% 10 years ago to 56% now. That's, that's just like a head-blowing uh, number. In Georgia, they go from 75% 10 years ago to 58% today. The only jurisdiction that really bucks this trend, weirdly enough, is New York. But that's a little misleading because in the middle of all this, they switched to the UBE. Their overall pass rate back in 11, 2012, was 61% in New York. Today, it's only 60%. Why? I think when we switch over to the UBE, we saw some weird bumps along the way there. And then when we got down to uh, Texas, is the other state I wanted to identify, they went from a 75% pass rate to a 64% pass rate. So other than New York, every major jurisdiction has seen a decline in the last 10 years. And of course, we've seen that happening in real time. Yeah, it's very interesting because California used to be an outlier. It was just this notorious, oh, the California bar is impossible. It's so hard, hardest in the country. And I think what we've seen over the last decade is that uh, while it is still the low pass rate, I believe, or one of the consistently lowest, it is no longer way out there in terms of how low their percentage rate is for passers. And that's really disturbing to see because that's certainly not the way that we keep the legal profession strong by shutting, shutting all of these law school grads out nationwide. Yeah, and just to put it in perspective, Illinois 10 years ago was an 81% pass rate. This last year, they were at 61%. They're right around where California is. So when you're seeing those kinds of numbers, what that's telling you is that it's not just an outlier exam, as you were saying, like California or Florida, but now it's across the country. The UBE is, is doing the same thing. And when you look at that, it, it is really stunning to see what's going on. And you have to ask in a state like Florida, what the heck? Why are we seeing these huge drops, Florida and Georgia, in pass rates over 10 years? Did the exam get harder? Did students get less prepared? What's going on here? So I think that it is a troubling sign. I think all of the numbers point in directions that we would not like to see them, both the average and the 10-year 
trend line. I think that the good news for those of you who are in our course is that you are in the, the only course I'm aware of that actually focuses on repeat takers and has a methodology and a strategy for dealing with the exam. I think if you're sitting in a big box bar review and you're listening to this as a podcast later, I would be very nervous because those numbers are not in your favor. All right. Well, thank you. And that's a big part of this is a lot of times when we fail, it's because we don't trust ourselves. We don't believe in our choices that we make. So right now, beginning right now, you have to trust in yourself. You have to believe in yourself. You have to realize you've made good choices and that you belong here. You belong here and you're going to be ready to pass this exam. And it really is that easy but you have to have that belief pattern to make it happen. And if you're struggling, get the tools to help. There's, you don't need to ride the struggle bus. <laughs> All right, that's it. I'm done. Wow. <laughs> Such wisdom. So, thanks, June. That's fabulous. Okay. So as June was talking about how for the coaching calls, we're really focusing right now on the July students. I want to talk about something for the February students. So Jackson, I know we've been uh, talking about this at the last couple of webinars, but we want to keep it on people's radar that we will be doing boot camp live in person. Yeah, June, I know we're so excited. It's going to be live and in person this year in October. And Jackson, what do people need to know about? that and why should they come yeah first of all you should come so that you can figure out what that picture on the uh, private community group is june you want to tell us the picture that you posted with the follow the yellow brick road yeah yeah yeah, yeah about i don't know why I can't, you have to boot camp to find out yeah there's a picture up of the june with the uh, the cowardly uh, lion and the, the tin man and yeah. there's more to come. I know June has promised some other pictures from prior boot camps. Boot camp is a live two-day event here in Celebration, Florida at the very lovely Artisan Park Clubhouse. We will be working with 15 students, so it is a very personalized experience. We cut down the size dramatically in part because of COVID, but also because we wanted to give you the most personal attention we could. So Megan will be doing writing coaching. June will be doing mindset coaching. I will be teaching photo reading and the application of photo reading. And then uh, we will also be talking about mind mapping, which we know is a huge thing. And we will have a, we will bring in your lunch on Friday and Saturday. We will have a dinner catered on Friday night and guest speakers. And it is going to be a wonderful event. Now, June will be able to put up the link here. What you have to do is make a deposit to reserve your seat. The current fee, discounted fee for boot camp is $2,000. That covers everything except your travel and lodging. And you make a deposit, which is fully refundable, and the balance will be due on September 10th. If you don't make the balance of your payment at that time, you'd lose your spot and we'll go to the waiting list of the next person there. But 15 people is not a lot of people. And so you need to move on that pretty quickly. The deposit, I think, can be as low as $250. It's really just to secure your seat. So if you're a February or July 2023 bar taker, I cannot recommend this highly enough. Megan, I know you're, you're you just, you love boot camp, right? This is like a happy place for you. Yeah, it's really, there's no uh, substitute for actually being together in person. It's amazing. The conversations outside of even the structured times are really wonderful. People getting to hear each other's stories, getting to know one another, getting to know us and us getting to know you. And then, oh my goodness, just the amount of writing, intensive writing work that I can do with someone when they are sitting in a room with me. And I'm not just getting their essay emailed to me, but I'm actually watching them construct it. Is It is gold. I love it so much. So yes, highly recommend. And June, I know you love it as well. Yeah. And June will be doing mindset coaching and I can't wait. She can actually go outside. There's a beautiful park and pool right behind where we're working. And I have this picture of June going out in the shade of the tree and uh, just doing some really quiet, good brain work. Yeah. I'm fun. excited. <laughs> I love boot camp, and I love being able to work really one-on-one, -on -one, even in a group setting with everybody and developing those connections. It's just, it really, I think is life-changing. And, and as I posted last night in the community center, <clears throat> the majority of students who have come to previous boot camps pass. 
And I'm just going to leave that there. Yeah. And I know that sometimes people want, and it's a funny thing, I'm just me, but I know that people want to connect with me individually and personally. This is your only chance to do it. I don't go on the road. So it's, it's, you come to me, <laughs> I'm too old now to go on the road. But if you want to, if you want to have me teaching, which I think is a pretty good experience in person, this is your best chance to get it. And whether you're a photo reader or not, I'm going to teach you photo reading because I really believe it makes a difference. I will teach you in three hours. I'm the only certified photo reading teacher in the world that specializes in high stakes testing like this. I think it's a great experience. So we hope you'll join us. 15 students, put down your deposit, secure your seat. And if we get past those 15, we're going to take a wait list. So uh, we'll see what happens. So join us at boot camp. It will be October 14th and 15th, 2022. Lovely time to be here in Celebration, Florida, just outside Orlando. Wonderful. Great. Thanks so much. All right, let's turn to study strategy questions that are uh, actually both about the MBE, and then we'll transition into our more in-depth discussion of how to tackle the MBE questions. So the first one, do I still have you? I got it, yeah. Oh, okay, the first question is, I'm reaching out to get some pointers on how I should spend my study time going forward. I'm in the review phase. I did the 91 MBE and got a raw score of 131. I did the 2021 MBE. 40. So, okay, sorry. What I heard was that the student had a 131 on the February 91 and maybe a 140 on the 2021 exam. And then what was their question? They're wondering if they can focus, if they should be focusing on the state specific law and essays now. Yeah. For a student that's retaking, and and I don't want people to freak out, that's a student that's been studying for some time. It's not where we would expect you to be in the studies today. Those are good scores on the MBE. And so just use your common sense. Those numbers are way passing on multi-state. You would add 15 or 20 points to the, to the raw score there. So I think clearly they could go on and, and start to focus on state materials and just do some random questions, maybe 10, 15 MBE questions a night from the random and um, online group of 800 questions just to stay sharp. Would you have any other suggestions for that student? No, I think that's great. You don't want to completely abandon the MBE work is my biggest fear sometimes with people <laughs> when they hit that point is that they say, okay, great. You still have two months. We want to keep all that fresh. Also knowing that those are potential essay topics as well. So you want to keep practicing them in that context too. Last question. I had a question regarding performance on the MBE. When should we be worried about performance? For the first 100 in each subject, I'm scoring between 30 to 48% correct consistently. My score hasn't improved. Should I be concerned? No, you shouldn't be concerned, but you should continue to work. We don't see any correlation between the first 100 question performance and ultimate performance. This is one of the MBE tips we're going to talk about either today or next week. But fundamentally, use these questions to learn from and don't be worried about the performance numbers. If you're building mind maps and notes from this, you're learning and you're getting what we want you to get. Ultimately, you don't really care about any of the numbers as being predictive until you get to the full length exams. Okay, great. All right, I think we're ready to move on to the MBE strategies now for the rest of our time. Okay, so we wanted to talk today about MBE tips. And I did a search online and found a ton of videos and items uh, from other bar review providers and uh, experts about what they thought was important for the MBE. And as I watched it, I felt, felt a little bit like Linus listening to his big sister, Lucy, in Your Good Man, Charlie Brown, when she explains how everything works and she says, snow is what causes grass to come up from the ground. <laughs> and then he looks at her and goes, yeah, I don't think so. There are a lot of tips out there that are absolutely toxic things that you should never be doing. And I thought it was time to clear the record a little bit, talk about some things that based on my 35 years of teaching, and Megan, you're now up to what, 11 or 12 years of teaching, that we have seen about the MBE. The test is not what it was, five years ago. Would you agree, Megan, it's evolved over time? Yeah, it's certainly when we look back at some of the older released questions, they are in formats that the NCB no longer uses, sometimes for the better. And certainly the, the content has changed a bit over the years of what's testable and what's not, even adding on a whole new subject. Yeah, and when you've got those changes and you've got people really giving the same 
discussion that they were giving 10, 15, 20 years ago, it just doesn't work very well. So this is an updated current list of things that I think actually move the needle, change your score. And so we're going to go through them and talk about them, and I hope it's helpful for you. Let's go ahead and dive in. We've got 10 tips for the MBE, and we're going to talk about each one in turn, but I want to just overview all 10 for you at the beginning. Tip number one will be to answer questions quickly. We're going to give you a specific approach and time frame for this. But again, what we want you to do is not try to grind your way through. And a lot of the advice out there is precisely the opposite. It's grind and work hard on every question and figure it out. We're going to say that's not correct, and we're going to show you why. The second tip we're going to talk about today is that you need to answer questions intuitively. Again, this goes to the idea of knowing the law versus memorizing the law. And intuition, or what we call selective intuition, is a game changer for people. And so we want to say and talk a little bit about that. The third tip that we've got, we just call them repetition. I could say repetition. It is literally learning through repetition instead of memorization. And Megan, when you hear these tips from other companies all the time, what do you hear? Memorize, recite, set up mnemonics, do all of that kind of cramming, right? That's the preferred model that most people have. That's not what we teach. Yeah, we're not a flashcard uh, company. <laughs> we're not a flashcard kind of company. That's right. The fourth thing that we're going to talk about that I think is really goes to the innovation of studying for the exam is to use mind maps. And we believe so much in mind maps. We are seeing these results over and over again, where people that are using mind maps are getting great improvement in their scores. So we're going to talk about that. And tip number five is clearly something that no one else in Bar Review is doing. We are telling you to be a photo reader. I cannot emphasize it enough. I continue to do interviews with successful students, and they continue to tell me, yeah, photo reading works. It made a huge difference. I don't know why it works or how it works, but it makes a difference, and particularly on the multi-state. So we're going to talk about that. So we have these five things that I would say are positives, and then we've got five more tips that really are kind of things to avoid. And the first of those is don't overanalyze. Don't struggle on a question trying to do too much and overanalyze the problem. We're going to talk about why that's problematic for you. Number seven on our list, we already alluded to, don't memorize. It's the opposite of repetition. You do not want to memorize. It's an incredible time waster, isn't it? You think about how long it takes to memorize something. And Megan, I know you've got uh, now, what, a fifth grader and a third grader. They don't memorize. Yeah, the it's really interesting because I feel like when I was in school, it was very much memorizing facts and dates and your multiplication tables and all that. And at least in our district, they've really moved away from that model into more of a deeper understanding. And my kids do, <laughs> funny, they do the same thing we do as a course, which is the spiral review stepped repetition, that repetition versus mem rote memorization. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that in a little more detail as well. And then number eight on our list is really simple. It's okay to miss a question. Some people think they got to get them all right, don't they? <laughs> and we're going to talk about how many questions you can actually miss and why it's okay to miss a question. And then number nine on our list is you got to learn from your mistakes. It, this is something where people get into what June calls this mindset. I'm in a, oh, what is the word, June? Growth, not clothes. Yeah, growth, right, growth mindset. The other one is closed mindset, isn't it? Closed mindset. Yeah, so we want that as the approach that you're taking, particularly on the MBE. And then number 10 is ultimately, this is about a process, not the outcome. And so much of what I saw out there on the internet is all about outcome and nothing about process. It's just grind it out and get this score. And if I'm looking at those things, I'm like, how's that supposed to happen? What's the process? So those are our 10 tips for the multi-state. If you uh, check out right now, you've got those 10. But now, Megan, let's go ahead and do a little bit deeper dive. Are you ready? Great. Okay. So we said that tip number one was to answer quickly. We have got thousands, tens of thousands of data points over the 30 years or so that we've been teaching the MBE. And our predecessor company, which started actually in 1972, so the MBE, we're now over 50 years of experience. That's pretty scary, isn't it? And one of the things that we discovered, probably the primary thing we discovered, was that when we timed people, which is something we could do in their MBE questions, we found that there was a sweet spot in order to reach a correct answer. 
The sweet spot was from the time that an applicant opens and starts to read the question until they mark their answer. If they are between 85 and 95 seconds, that is where the most correct answers occur. That's surprising, isn't it, Megan? Yeah, I think it's maybe at first glance, it would be surprising. I'm sorry for the dog barking, but it, when you think about it, it makes sense, right? That we can't will ourselves into the right answer here. And that really, if you know and have internalized the law behind it, that the right answer and thinking about it for another three minutes is not going to magically make the right answer. Yeah. And I think that's really the, the key point. And, and Moose, your dog was absolutely correct. <laughs> that, that, that when you know something, you should be able to answer pretty qu quickly. And if you don't know it, sitting there and staring at it isn't going to change anything. The problem is that a lot of people have talked themselves into the idea that the longer they stay on a question, the better their results will be. And the uh, data points point to exactly the opposite. After about 105 seconds, virtually drops off a cliff, very low chance, less than 25% chance of getting the answer correct. So that means you need to answer quickly. And one of the best tools that somebody just told me about the other day was just taking a 90 second egg timer, one of those sand in the hourglass things, and just flipping it over as they do their practice questions. I thought that was a great way to make sure you were at 90 seconds each time. So we want you to answer questions quickly even when you don't feel like you should do it. This will improve your score more than anything I think you can do in many respects. Anything else you want to say about tip number one, Megan? No, I think that's great. It's a discipline. It is a discipline for sure. Let's go to number two, and it's related, and it's to answer intuitively. This is one of the ways you can answer in 90 seconds. Megan and I have been doing over the past year or so, a whole bunch of practice MBE questions and including them in the course and making them available to our students. And when we do that, we talk about selective intuition. Now the process of selective intuition is that you read a problem and then before you look at the four answer choices, you preview the result that you think uh, is appropriate. And this makes a big difference, doesn't it? To do that before you look at the answer choices. Yeah, I think it lets you trust yourself a little bit more. It's hard to trust yourself when you're staring at four choices and you can go back and forth and back and forth. But if you already have something in mind and then you see it, it lets you, it gives you a little bit of confidence, right? It gives you that boost of, oh, I know what I'm talking about here. Yeah, and I think this is really important. And so in our in the course, we talk about selective intuition. We do a lot of videos about it. But functionally, what it means is that if you've previewed your answer, then you're able to go in, look, and see what matches your answer. And if you see it, mark it and move on immediately. If you don't see that answer, then you can do a little bit more of a deeper dive, but it just gets you much more focused. And as Megan said earlier, you begin to listen a little more carefully. You begin to trust yourself a little bit more. When we get students to answer intuitively, we see their scores go up almost without exception. It's when they don't trust themselves and they then slip out of that mode, almost like they're uh, slipping from an electric engine in their car to a gas engine, but there's no gasoline in the gas engine. It just doesn't work. So you've really got to be able to work in this intuitive basis. And so this is our second tip, and I think it's an important one. Tip number three, we said was repetition, and Megan called it spaced or stepped repetition. Essentially, it's the way that the human brain is wired to learn. For so, for so long, we thought that the way you learned was through memorization. It was through cramming and forcing material into your brain. But what happens when you try to put all that material into your brain? You push other material out. And so, therefore, it's a zero-sum game. The advantage of repetition for the, for the multi-state is that you can continuously add material, and as you repeat over and over, you are putting that material in your non-conscious brain, where then you can use it for selective intuition and for answering quickly. This idea of spaced or stepped repetition is one that we know really works, and it has been adopted now, as you heard Megan say, in her school district, but in school districts around the country, and it really started at Harvard with Project Zero and the work that Howard Gardner did, and I think it makes a huge difference, don't you? Yeah, it really does, because... 
It is the way that we learn most things. So think about the things that you've learned organically in your life. And it's the, your grandmother's recipe by heart, because you made that cake a hundred times. And so you don't even need to glance at the card anymore, or you know how to change the oil in your car because you've done it a hundred times and you don't have to look up that YouTube video anymore. It's the things that we do in our lives over and over again, that we don't have to think about. They come automatically. And that's our goal with the bar exam is that in and everything from do writing with me, I'll talk to you about that, that I want the mechanics to be of the actual writing to become that way. You have repeated it so often that you're not even thinking about how to put it together anymore. You just know how to do it. But then also the same with the law itself, that it's something that you have used and manipulated and thought about and considered in so many ways over and over again that you don't have to force it. It just naturally flows because you have a deeper understanding of it. Yeah, I, I think it, it really is fundamental to our learning approach. We're going to have you read, then we're going to have you watch a lecture, and in the lecture, you're going to see the text, and then we're going to have you do practice questions, then we're going to pull the subject away, bring it back, and do it all over again. And I think that repetition is really what helps people have that deeper understanding. So we think this is a key to the multi-state, definitely more productive than any other way that I think you can learn the material. All right. Related to that is how do you take your notes? And our fourth tip for the MBE is something that Megan, you and I feel very strongly about, and that is using mind maps. Mind maps, for those of you that don't know, are visual note-taking systems. They are uh, similar to a branch of a tree or a trunk of a tree with branches. They take color and icons, and they take words and phrases and pictures, and you start putting together the material in a way that shows the relationship between subjects. Now, we know that this is more effective than what I call a linear note-taking or a traditional note-taking system. The problem with traditional note-taking system is that we tend to just take things and type them out or write them out, and we just keep making longer and longer lists, and the list doesn't have any context to it at all. On the other hand, when you build a mind map, whether you're using a computer aid to do it or you're doing it by hand, is that you start to create a visual outline for your non-conscious brain of where things fit in and you see the relationship between cons. For example, if you're doing con law, I think that's a great example, don't you, of concepts that just seem totally unrelated, certainly in the bar exam. And yet when you put them in a mind map, you begin to see that, oh, there is some connection between the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment. There's some connection between the federal system and the state system. And in seeing that, what happens is that you have greater recall of the material. What's your experience been with mind maps? I think that mind maps fit really nicely into the last MBE tip as well with the repetition, because yeah. the creation of the mind map itself is repetition, right? That you are going back into the material and you are writing it or typing it in a new way, which is really helpful, right? Because uh, it's teaching it to yourself, which is an incredibly helpful way to learn something. And then what you're doing is it's not a, it's not a document that just stays still, right? And that's not it. And then you file it away somewhere and never look at it again. It's something that is dynamic and that you're constantly adding to. And then when you get deeper into your review stage, you're going back and looking at your mind maps daily, speaking them out loud to yourself, talking through them to yourself, noticing where you have gaps, noticing where you wrote something down and you're like, I literally have no idea what that means. And going and doing a deeper dive on that to understand so that you didn't just write down the sort of magic words, but instead you actually understand when they apply and how they apply. So I think that the mind maps are very, a very key piece in my mind of the repetition uh, part yeah. of the study. Yeah, I totally agree. And at boot camp, where we're in a live training session, we will create mind maps. We've done that before. And then people get up and actually look at other people's mind maps on the subject and they read them out loud to each other. And it's fascinating because you're actually interacting with the material in a much deeper way than you would with a traditional note taking system. Now, some people say, I don't have time to use a mind map. But in fact, it's actually one of those productive uses of your time, don't you think? 
Yes, 100%. And so we build that into our course. We show you how to mind map, and we show you how long it should take you to mind map. But if you want to improve your score on the MBE, man, use mind maps. It will help. You'll be amazed uh, at what that does when you start to actually get into the material instead of dealing with it in that superficial memorization, non-repetition model. So that's our fourth tip. Our fifth tip is certainly the one that that probably, I don't know, I don't, I wouldn't say it's controversial anymore. When I started teaching photo reading now 12, 13 years ago, it was controversial. Today, we've got hundreds and hundreds of students who photo read. In fact, the majority of our students are photo readers. And when we do our interviews with successful students, they're almost entirely photo readers. It just makes a huge difference. If you don't know what we're talking about, photo reading is a whole mind reading system that lets you read into your non-conscious brain. Now, it's not a gimmick. Reading is a state-dependent activity. That is, when you are reading for a specific purpose, then instead of trying to go slowly and work at it word by word, what we're doing is taking advantage of the incredible processing power of the non-conscious brain. Your non-conscious brain can take in literally millions of bytes of information per second, but our conscious brains only take in about 10 bytes, not 10 million, 10 per second. So there's a massive difference uh, in what you're capable of doing at the non-conscious level. So photo reading is really non-conscious reading. And you'd say, what good does it do me if I'm non-conscious? Well, this is where the other tips like mind mapping and working through repetition come into play because Photo reading for the bar exam is a system that allows you to read a bar subject outline in 10 minutes or less, and then create mind maps, go through lectures, do question practice, and the term that we use is to activate. And when you're activating the material, what's happening is you're triggering in your non-conscious the material that you've just read and bringing it to mind, and you will have remarkable recall at that point. Now, in your conscious brain, you'll have nothing. It is not satisfying to the conscious mind. But what a photo reader does on the MBE is that they read a problem, and then going back to that second tip about answering intuitively, the problem triggers their non-conscious understanding of the material. It shows them in their non-conscious brain the mind maps they created, and we have photo readers who tell us that on the exam, they literally see the correct answer in bold, or it pops up physically off the page to them, or it's in a different color to them. There's any number of different ways that it manifests or they just know in their deep, know that they know what the answer is. And so we see students getting 30 and 40 point jumps in their MBE scaled score after they become photo readers. And not everybody wants to photo read, we get that. But honestly, there's not a reason not to. It's such a powerful tool and we now know that it really works. And we've developed over the years a series of tools to help you activate the material. It's pretty crazy to watch, isn't it, Megan? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really fantastic to see how well it can work for so many people, which is awesome. One more tool yeah. in your toolbox. Absolutely. I think this is a good place to stop. We've gone through five of our tips. Can we come back next week and show everybody the rest of our tips and, and see what we've got there? Yeah. But yeah, that was fun, wasn't it? Looking at the first five things you can do. And I would say almost all of those are completely counterintuitive to what everybody else out there says, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. A lot of them are a bit against the grain, but I always feel like if going with the grain has not worked for you, if going with the grain has worked for you, fantastic. But if going with the green has not worked for you, you've got to try something different. And that's what we always are talking about, that you can't continue to do the same thing and expect to get different results. Yeah. I think it's worth it to try something a little bit different. Yeah. In some cases, maybe a lot different, but really effective. So next week, we'll come back. We'll do tips six through 10. We'll post these five tips in your course materials under MBE tips part one, and uh, then we'll be back for that. So I want to just wrap up today by saying thanks to everybody. We're glad you're here. We're seeing a lot of you on the, uh, the live calls. That's very exciting. If you're here on the replay, we're glad to have you with us as well. And if you're listening later through our podcast, we're certainly excited to have you as part of our audience. I hope everybody has a good study week. If you've been feeling the pressure and the stress this week, oh boy, we know it. We understand it. It does get better, as we said. So hang in there. And as we've been telling you all the way through today's episode, use the tools that are available. It will make a difference. Thanks, June, for being here. Megan, thank you. Glad you're feeling better. And uh, you got through the seventh week too. 
Yeah, exactly. All right. Best of luck this week with your studies, everyone. All right. Take care, everybody. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening and watching the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers at celebrationbarreview.com.